I'm uh, Dr. Michael Ryan. I'm the head of vertebrate paleontology here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and we're downstairs in the collections of my laboratory. So Spinops is a new horned dinosaur. It's uh, related to things like Triceratops, even though Triceratops came about 10 million years later. It's found in southern Alberta in a place known as Dinosaur Provincial Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There's been a lot of new dinosaurs that have come out of there over the years. Um, historically, things like Strachosaurus, Centrosaurus have come out of there. More recently, I named a new species of Ceratopsian dinosaur, Centrosaurus brinkmani, from the area. And if you go a little bit further south, I named an animal named Alberta Ceratops in 2007. So the new animal, Spinops, is actually based upon a skull that was collected back in the 1920s by the Sternbergs. It was sold by Canada to the British Museum, and it's been sitting in the collections of the British Museum in London for almost 70 plus years. Back in the 80s, we had a series of scientists doing research on a variety of things who'd looked at it and said, oh, this looks a little bit different than something else. So about five years ago, myself and our, the colleagues that co-authored the paper with me put together a little research consortium to get the material prepared in London and then write the new paper about it. So Spinops is a horned dinosaur, similar to animals known as Triceratops and Stracosaurus. Um, some of the listeners might be more familiar with the younger animal, much bigger, known as Triceratops. If you uh, came across Spinops in the wild, if you were lucky enough to do that 65, 70 million years ago, you'd see an animal that was something about the size of a large bull, has a large shield coming off the back of its skull, and there's two large spikes coming off of that. Forward over the face at the front part of the furrow, there's two little hooks that come forward. So for people who, under, who know the animal known as Strachosaurus with large spikes on the back of its frill, and Centrosaurus with these big banana-like spikes that come forward, Spinops is like a mesh of those two animals together. It has the best characteristics of both of those. It's a plant eater, so it would have been uh, walking through the um, floodplain environment, eating low lycopods and uh, ferns and other carnivorous plants, and keeping a wary eye out for animals like um, Displetosaurus and other large carnivorous dinosaurs that would want to eat it. Um, the research adds, of course, to our knowledge of dinosaurs. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is understand ancient paleo environments. We were trying to understand the cycle of evolution and extinction of of animals and plants within ancient environments and take that data and try to apply it to what's going on in the modern world. We are, uh, mankind is up against a lot of modern ecological problems and if we can get some information or possible answers of how, we've, how the earth has addressed these issues of extinction in the past, we might be able to come up with some solutions for the future. So um, Spinops is an animal very similar to, the, to other dinosaurs such as Strachosaurus with, with large spikes on the back of its frill and another horned dinosaur called Centrosaurus that has these large banana-like spikes that come forward over its face. And if you took those two types of spikes from those two different animals and merged them together, you would have Spinops. So large spikes off the back of the frill and large pro-curving horns coming forward. It would have had a short horn, um, sort of a large pointy horn over its nose, and almost no horns over its eyes. So it would differ from Triceratops that way. So the history of Spinops is somewhat convoluted because it was originally collected back in the 20s by the Sternbergs. They sold it to the British Museum that used it as a representation of a horned dinosaur. Um, the material is not, none of the skulls that we have are totally articulated, so we've got parts and pieces of things. And they look very similar to, as I've mentioned previously, Centrosaurus and Stracosaurus. However, in the last decade or two, we've had a number of visiting researchers to that museum report back that they think it may not look exactly like those things. Maybe it's something brand new. So about a decade ago, in 2000, in fact, I went over to, to look for the specimen and it couldn't be found. It had just vanished out of the British Museum. And then a couple of years later, um, a colleague of mine who was then doing his PhD, Andy Farkey, the lead author in this paper, went back and said, lo and behold, we found it. So he and I decided to um, collaborated on this project. We brought in Dr. Paul Barrett, who's the dinosaur paleontologist at the London Museum. And then because we were working on a variety of different aspects of the animal's anatomy, environment, we, and preparation, we brought in some other collaborators. So we've got a total of six or seven people on the paper. Mm. You know, <clears throat> I work in horned dinosaurs a lot. And when I started off and doing these things, they were all, everyone was unique and different. And the more I look at them, the more they look similar. And what we found in Dinosaur Provincial Park is that every time we find a new type of horned dinosaur, it fills in the gap morphologically between two other forms. So in Dinosaur Park, we have a rock record that starting low down and going up high to prairie level covers about two million years, maybe not quite that much. And within that rock record, we've got a succession of horned dinosaurs. 
and we probably have at least two or three, probably now four horned dinosaurs in that, which are segregated from each other. And the one at the top and the bottom look quite a bit different, but the two in the middle look very similar to each other. And when you actually look at the continuum from top to bottom, what we're seeing is a gradation of characters. So the horns, one horn may be very, lo very long in one type and very short in the other, but the intermediate forms that we're finding stratigraphically are starting to fill in those morphological gaps. So the short answer is the more we find, the more they look similar to one another. Seasons can break these things down. So an exposed fossilized bone within five years will be totally destroyed. So we collect whatever we, we find that we find that we deem significant and we take that back to the museum. If it's an important research specimen, we'll immediately open up our field jacket and do the preparation and do the research and write the papers. But sometimes we collect a specimen because we would like to do research on it, but maybe we'll get to it next year. And of course, the next summer we go out and find more material and that specimen we collected last year slips back and back off our plate. So if you go to major museums around the world, London, Toronto, New York, Cleveland, you'll find that we have field jackets or specimens that have been collected 10, 20, 30, 100 years ago that nobody's got around to doing research on. And it's not because we don't want to, it's a, it's a matter of manpower and the amount of time and money it takes to prepare these specimens. So it's not unusual for paleontologists, certainly the new younger generation who are getting jobs in the last five to 10 years, to go back into their own collections and say, what has been collected previously that I think would be an interesting research project? You open up that field jacket and you get something like our new skull. I've got projects that I'm initiating at some of the museums with colleagues around the world that literally we're opening up field jackets that are no less than 90 years old.